Uh, hi everyone, my name's Nolan and I am a SimCity addict. I've been clean for about six months now, but before that, um, I lost everything. My wife left me, I lost my job, uh, but I believe in the steps and, you know, I'm here to build a better life without SimCity. And of course, I would also like to welcome you to Pop Culture Urbanism. That's right, today on Pop Culture Urbanism, we're gonna be talking about the infamous city simulator, SimCity, a game where you can carve out zones, build infrastructure with ease, adjust local ordinances, tinker with tax policy, and even call disasters at will. Now, after 30 years of this seminal city planning franchise, it's time that we look back on SimCity and talk about what they got right, what made the franchise so awesome, and what they got wrong. <laughs> Long before we could build simulation cities, we had to first break them. In 1985, game developer Will Wright was working on a game called Raid on Bungling Bay, where you controlled an attack helicopter as you destroyed the military infrastructure of a city, or else the Bungling Empire becomes too powerful and takes over the world. While building the levels, Will Wright found that he had a lot more fun building the bases than actually destroying them. The result would come four years later with the release of SimCity in 1989. The game was radically different from games of the time. Instead of players having a clear, direct objective to win the game, they were given essentially a sandbox of undeveloped land, a stack of cash, and a few basic planning tools, and let loose on the city. Should they feel so inclined, they can also destroy it. It was a commercial success, selling over 300,000 units on the PC and almost 2 million units on the Super Nintendo. Impressively, all 2 million or so of those copies include an instruction manual with a bibliography of all things. After explaining mechanisms like traffic management and municipal finance, the guide casually directs players to read city planning heavyweights like Kevin Lynch and Le Corbusier, an obtuse book on population projection, and of course the American Planning Association's monthly magazine. These suggested readings help to reveal the ideological underpinnings of SimCity. One of the books that Will Wright references as heavily influential on the development of SimCity is Urban Dynamics, a wonky text by MIT engineer J. Wright Forrester, which models the city as a system of inputs and outputs that could be tinkered with on behalf of the greater good. For Forrester, a city can be broken out into a simple set of variables, population, housing, and industry, and mechanically controlled by planners. This book, published in 1969, reflects the kind of post-war engineering optimism that jives with computer programming and the creation of a simulation city. Looking at the box art for the original SimCity, the game looks like some kind of machine with buttons, dials, and levers. If only city planning were so easy. As the franchise grew into SimCity 2000, then 3000, then 4, the series increasingly built their chops as the definitive city planning simulator, creating swatches for meeting with angry citizens, budgeting public dollars, deal making with neighboring cities, and a focus on data that real city planners can only dream of. Of course, games have to balance realism with fun. There's no way you'd want to play a game where you have to spend your Thursday evening in the town hall chamber getting berated by members of the public. Trust me, I've been there. But it's curious to look at the fast sense of city planning that SimCity keeps and which elements they totally do away with. For one, the bedrock of SimCity is zoning. Cities use zoning to dictate what uses are allowed in what places and at what densities. And the same is true for SimCity, where you're presented with a totally blank field at the start of the game and enjoy total control over how the city will be laid out, scrambling to adjust after the fact as your city grows. The trouble with zoning, both in real cities and SimCity, are manifold. As many players pointed out in response to the SimCity reboot in 2013, the mixture of uses that traditionally characterizes dense cities, such as apartments over shops, isn't allowed. Worse yet, zoning often artificially suppresses densities and blocks growth, driving up housing costs in the process. Of course, in SimCity, you can change zones with the click of a button, turning single-family homes into apartments as demand for housing rises. But the politics of zoning in the real world rarely works out this way. Take a seemingly innocuous case like erecting an office building. In SimCity, one simply plops down the zoning and allows it to happen, assuming there's demand for it. In most American cities, particularly along the coast, this would require a change in zoning, followed by an environmental study and an extensive public review. Talk about a game-breaking bug. Suck. One thing that SimCity doesn't even try to emulate is the extreme need for parking. SimCity's lead designer Stone LeBrand explains. When I started measuring out our local grocery store, which I don't think of as being that big, I was blown away by how much more space was parking lot rather than actual store. 
That was kind of a problem because we were originally just going to model real cities, but we quickly realized that there were way too many parking lots in the real world, and that our game was going to be really boring if it was proportional in terms of parking lots. So what we do in the game is that we just imagine they're underground. We do have parking lots in the game, and we do try to scale them. So if you have a little grocery store, we put six or seven parking spots on the side. And if you have a big convention center or a big pro stadium, they'll have what seem like really big lots. But they're nowhere near what a real grocery store or pro stadium would have. We had to do the best we could and still make the game look attractive. One nice thing about the game is that it gives you clarifying objectives for good city building. Things like shorten commutes, keep housing accessible, and reduce pollution. In the real world of city planning, your job is much more on a project by project basis, so you often don't get to focus on what might be some really high level goals for making cities great. Many cities, including New York City, lack a comprehensive plan altogether. The game also centers on physical planning, things like streets, parks, underground pipes, and public facilities, where this tends to happen in a fairly ad hoc fashion in the real world, hence why US cities are so characterized by aimless cul-de-sacs and oddly placed schools. But it wasn't always so. Older East Coast cities like New York City and Savannah were laid out pursuant to a clear plan of gridded streets and regular parks, which gives them their special charm. In SimCity, the game literally doesn't start until the player comes up with such a plan, taking that virgin field and physically laying out the bones of the city to come. While changes can be made later, you're really more a god than a planner, meaning ex post facto fixes are easy, the idea is to lay the groundwork for an efficient city from the word go. And fun as that may be, this near unlimited power on the part of player as planning god may be the biggest drawback of the series. It's just not that realistic. While the original game prided itself on realism, the true special interests that form and deform city planning are mostly absent, especially in later editions, and of course its mobile spin-off. The player doesn't have to overcome special interests. The player can't be fired or voted out of office. They can't be undermined by endless litigation or shouted at in a public hearing. Over the past 30 years, SimCity has inspired, or maybe more accurately, fooled a generation of gamers into going into city planning, drunk on visions of unbridled power. But maybe the series should return to its roots with a bit of uncool realism, adding back in the clumsy process and raucous politics that defines planning today. Other games like Tropico are strongly centered around balancing these efforts. And perhaps for a franchise struggling to stand up to the competition, I'm looking at you, City Skylines, adding these seemingly uncool elements of the city planning experience would give rise to a generation of city planners actually prepared to play the game. That's all for today's episode of Pop Culture Urbanism. I've been your host, Nolan Gray. Be sure to hit that subscribe button, uh, like the video, and down in the comments below, let me know. Should I let's play SimCity or City Skylines? I leave it in your hands.